On this vote, the yeas are 236, the nays are 173. The bill is passed. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The chair will remind all persons in the gallery that they are here as guests of the House and that any manifestation of approval or disapproval of proceedings is in violation of the rules of the House. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we have order. House will be in order. The gentleman will suspend. The House will be in order. Members are asked to remove their conversations from the floor. The gentleman will proceed. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we still have order. The gentleman is correct. The House will come to order. I the gentleman is recognized. I thank the Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the Committee on Judiciary be discharged from further consideration of H.R. 962, the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, and ask for its immediate consideration in the House. Under guidelines consistently issued by successive speakers, as recorded in Section 956 of the House Rules and Manual, the Chair is constrained not to entertain the request unless it has been cleared by the bipartisan floor and committee leaderships. The gentleman is not recognized for debate. For what purpose does the gentleman from Maryland seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that when the House adjourns today, it adjourn to meet on Monday next, uh, when it shall convene at noon for morning business, uh, for morning hour debate, and 2 p.m. for legislative business. House will be in order. House will be in order. For what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to speak out of order for the purpose of inquiring the majority leader the schedule for next week. Without objection. And Mr. Speaker, I also ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Objection. Right, thank you, Mr. Speaker. With that, uh, I would be happy to yield to my friend, the gentleman from Maryland, to ask about the schedule. Gentleman will suspend. The House will be in order. Please take their conversations off the floor. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Mr. Speaker, on Monday, the House will meet at 12 p.m. for morning hour debate and 2 p.m. for legislative business, with votes postponed until 6.30 p.m. On Tuesday and Wednesday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for morning hour debate and 12 p.m. for legislative business. On Thursday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. for legislative business. We will consider several bills under suspension of the rules. 
the complete list of uh, suspension bills will be announced uh, by the close of business today. The House will also consider H.R. 1500, the mm -hmm. Consumer First Act. This legislation seeks to reverse the administration's efforts to dismantle the Consumer Financial uh, Protection Bureau. Uh, in addition, the House will consider H.R. 1994, setting every community uh, up for Retirement Enhancement Act of 2019. The legislation is intended uh, to increase the flexibility of 401k plans and improve access to the accounts, particularly for small businesses and their employees. The bill includes a host of provisions aimed at encouraging small businesses to provide private retirement benefits to their workers. And I yield back. I thank a gentleman for yielding back. I want to ask about the conversations and negotiations that are going on regarding the disaster supplemental. And uh, I know the gentleman uh, is well aware that there are some good, I think, very fruitful negotiations going on. Uh, clearly, we want to make sure that some of the things that weren't in the bill that went out of the House, especially as it relates to the crisis at the border, uh, as it deals with unaccompanied children, uh, as well as making sure that we get the right kind of help to our farmers who had devastation to their crops in these disasters. And uh, with that, I would yield to ask the gentleman if he could uh, maybe thank give us an indication of a timeline. And I thank the gentleman for his question. As the gentleman knows, uh, we passed an initial bill some, uh, some many weeks ago. Uh, the Senate didn't pass that. Uh, we had then passed more recently uh, a bill which did, in fact, take care of uh, everyone we know who has had a natural disaster in the interim, as well as those we had taken care of uh, the first time around. So that we think we have a good bill uh, that was passed. However, as you also referenced, the president has asked for an additional supplemental of a, a little over $4 billion dollars. Uh, uh, reference for humanitarian uh, issues at the border. Uh, that is being reviewed. As the gentleman probably also knows, uh, an offer was made uh, to our side. Uh, that offer has now been responded to uh, with respect to both the initial and the supplemental. The initial, I mean the disaster bill. Uh, and uh, we are looking for an answer back at some point in time uh, to our response, but hopefully we can reach agreement. Thank you, Mr. Uh, again, thank the gentleman from Maryland. Hopefully those conversations do continue on. I'm encouraged by uh, the, uh, the negotiations in terms of how uh, both sides seem to be willing to get this resolved, and hopefully quickly, uh, ideally, if we can have a bill on the floor next week, that would be a very bipartisan bill to address this so that we can get the relief the to all of will yield, And I'd be happy to yield. Clearly, if we get an agreement, and that, of course, is the if, big if, but hopefully we can. If we can do that, we want to move it as quickly as possible. I, I thank the gentleman from that, for that. I um, well, do want to ask about the appropriations process, because I know the gentleman from Maryland had talked earlier this week about uh, the desire to have the entire appropriations cut process completed by the end of June. Uh, also talked about a robust amendment process. I would just ask the gentleman, as we look at this week, the concerning trend that we've been talking about for a few weeks now, uh, when amendments came out of the Rules Committee this week, 26 amendments came out that were offered by Democrats, and only one amendment was allowed by a Republican. And as the gentleman from Maryland talks about a robust appropriations process, uh, I would hope he would pay closer attention to fairness in that robustness because 26 Democrat amendments allowed and only one Republican amendment allowed uh, is surely not a fair process, might be considered robust, but in a hyper-partisan sense. And so I hope as we get into the appropriations process, uh, the gentleman and the, especially the leadership from the Rules Committee would take into account uh, that this is a process where the House should be able to come together and offer their ideas, let the House and the will of the House prevail, but at least allow for that debate here on the House floor on as many amendments as possible in as fair of a way as possible, and I would yield. I thank the gentleman for his comment. We have had this discussion on a number of occasions. 
I am convinced that Mr. McGovern, the chairman of the Rules Committee, does in fact want to have the kind of process that we talked about and that you just referenced. Uh, he also uh, knows that in the last Congress we had the most closed close rules of any Congress in which I've served and perhaps in history, uh, 103 closed rules. Uh, but having said that, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, your uh, side will come forth with amendments that are, as you say, subject to rational debate on our uh, not gotcha amendments. Uh, I'm not alleging that there are gotcha amendments, but that's obviously a concern that you had when you were in charge and that we have when we're in charge. Uh, but uh, um, I know that Mr. McGovern wants to uh, have a fair process, and uh, we, we are, we're talking about that. To, uh, so, and I will continue to do that. I appreciate, I appreciate that. And again, we will we'll be watching and hopefully that uh, see that become more fair as we get into that appropriations process. Finally, I'd like to ask the gentleman about legislation that has been filed that is a companion to a Senate bill that passed the Senate by uh, with a vote of 77 votes on the BDS movement, to stand up against the BDS movement. Uh, as we both know, and I know the gentleman's been supportive of these efforts, the concern is that Israel continues to come under attack uh, by many countries around the world trying to delegitimize their economy, delegitimize uh, their status as a Jewish state uh, by this movement to undermine their economy, to boycott uh, and divest from Israel. And so we have legislation in the companion bill is H.R. 336 uh, by Mr. McCall from Texas and doesn't have the con concerns. There were some uh, concerns that with the way that the Senate bill came over, but at least we do know because of the vote with 77 votes, it was a very bipartisan vote, strong concern by the Senate to address this, strong concern by many members of the House, Republican and Democrat, to stand up to the BDS movement, and not just in words. Clearly, there's resolutions out there. We can all give speeches and say we're against it, but it actually takes real action, real uh, effort, things that are in the legislation that give teeth to our stand against BDS and for Israel. And of course, if you look at some of the examples in the legislation, not just words, but $33 billion in military assistance to Israel, security cooperation enhancements, uh, uh, things that ensure that Israel maintains a qualitative edge to defend itself from the daily threats that unfortunately we see uh, from other countries uh, and terrorist organizations that want to undermine their status as a Jewish state. And so with that, uh, could the gentleman uh, give us an indication would there be a timeline that we can establish to bring this bill to the floor short of the discharge petition? And there is a discharge petition with more than 180 signatures already on it uh, to bring this bill to the floor. But it would be a lot better if it was truly bipartisan from both leadership sides saying we're, we're willing to stand up against this movement, not just in words, but in deeds. And with that, I would yield to the gentleman. Well, first of all, I would say words are important. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and that's why we all debate, uh, because we think words are important. But having said that, I share the gentleman's view, as he well knows, with reference to the BDS movement, which I think is contrary to the interests of our ally Israel uh, and uh, contrary to our own interest. Having said that, uh, as I indicated to the gentleman last week, uh, I've been discussing this with Mr. Engel, uh, and uh, he is, as you know, uh, shares the view that I've expressed and you've expressed. And he's, the committee is going to be addressing that, uh, I expect, in the, in, the, uh, in the near term. And when they do, we will uh, decide what actions to take at that point in time. And I look forward to discussing it with the gentleman. We'll continue to discuss it. I appreciate that. And clearly, as we have an interest in not just expressing our words, like on many other important issues, we have to back that up with laws, legislation that gives teeth to the words and gives true support to our friends, especially Israel, in such a time of need where this movement is growing and we want to move as quickly as possible. And so we'll continue to have this conversation and hopefully get a formal timeline as soon as possible. And I'd yield. If the gentleman yield, but because he mentioned some components of, the, there are essentially four components of the bill to which he referred, uh, three of which are non-controversial, as the gentleman uh, knows, one of which has uh, 
uh, issues with respect to its constitutionality uh, without resolving that issue. Uh, the, the three uh, that are in that bill, uh, uh, I think, enjoy bipartisan support. Uh, they were held up in the Senate, as the gentleman uh, probably knows, uh, but we, we want to make sure all those three certainly are adopted. I uh, yield. Yeah, and uh, clearly the Senate looked at that as well, uh, worked through that. They actually made some changes to the bill, which we conformed into this the discharge petition has a rule that would actually conform it to the Senate to address those issues. And again, the Senate bill got 77 votes, uh, highly bipartisan, uh, especially on such an important issue. So hopefully we'll continue those conversations and come to an agreement on a timeline that's expedited. And with that, unless the gentleman has anything else, I would yield back the balance of my time. Thank yield you, Mr. Back. Speaker. I don't have any time, but I'll yield it back. <laughs> Gentlemen, All the remaining back. time. The chair will now entertain requests for one-minute speeches. For what purpose does a gentleman from California seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If we hold true to the idea that America stands for equality, equity, and diversity, then equal rights must apply, must apply to and be protected for all Americans. No American should be discriminated against because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. And yet, despite the historic accomplishments towards equality over the past decade, LGBTQ Americans still face systemic discrimination. We know the fight for equality is always on the right side of history. And today's passage of the Equality Act is a much needed step forward in that fight. Today's vote allows us to see the moral arc of the universe, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, bend towards justice. Thank you, and I. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arkansas seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor one of Arkansas's most successful football coaches, Tommy Tice of Huntsville, Arkansas, who retires this month after 42 years in coaching and athletic administration. Coach Tice coached more football games as a head coach than anyone in Arkansas history, 454 games. He had a combined record of 288 wins, 160 losses, and six ties, an overall winning percentage of 63 percent. He was selected head coach of the Arkansas All-Star football game six times. He had a state championship, 13 conference titles,